If you were given a chance to spend an hour with somebody you admire, who could this person be? Well, for me, this was not a difficult decision, and I didn't think twice. I decided to have this conversation with Alexander too, because Alex has been an inspiration for me for so many years. The life story of Alex is in a few words, a story of a man full of energy, joy, and constant optimism and excitement. Alex is a man who always looks for adventure. Well, that's what we all want, right? Or at least, that's what I want. Happy and adventurous life. Alex was born in Helsinki, Finland, into a bilingual family. His father was a Swedish-speaking Finn, and his mother a native Finnish speaker. Alex spoke both Finnish and Swedish in his home. Later he learned English, German and French, which he speaks fluently. As a politician, Alex served as the Prime Minister of Finland from 2014 to 2015. He served also in other political positions in Finland and abroad. He was appointed as the Minister of Foreign Affairs, a Minister for Europe and Foreign Trade, Minister of Finance. However, the year 2016 marked departure for Alex from Finnish politics after losing the leadership of his political party, the National Coalition Party, or Kokomos in Finnish. Then he left to continue his job as member of the Finnish parliament. A year later, in 2017, Alex was chosen as Vice President of the European Investment Bank. And in 2020, Alex returned to his academic roots, as he put it in his own words, becoming the Director of the School of Transnational Governance at the European University Institute in Florence, Italy. Join me and let's talk to Alex, hear what he has to say about his life, past, present and future. Let's also hear his reflections about Finnish, European and international politics. And I promise you, you wouldn't get bored. Hey Alex, nice to see you. Yeah, how's Florence? Florence is good. I just I just cycled down with full rain, so it was all right. Uh, where did you grow up exactly in Helsinki? And, uh... How was it to live in Helsinki back then? Yeah, sure. I mean, I mean, I was actually born on a funny day. I was born on the 1st of April, 1968. So I'm an April Fool's kid. And what made it a little bit special was that I was actually 5.5 kilos when I was born. So I was the heaviest baby in Helsinki yes. uh, in 20 years. At least that's the story that uh, my mother told me. And it certainly does look quite heavy on the birth certificate and the rest of it. And I, you know, I was born and raised in a, in a very normal fairly internationally oriented family so we, we lived on the outskirts actually last apartment building in helsinki uh to the western side and uh had a fairly normal childhood came from a bilingual family so i spoke finnish with my mother when she was still alive finnish with my brother and then swedish with uh, my dad and i I started off in a Finnish school for the first four years and I swapped over to a, a Swedish school after that. And for those of you who are not necessarily aware uh, of the intricacies of languages, Finnish and Swedish have nothing to do with each other. So, you know, Swedish is much closer to Italian than to Finnish. But, yeah, very, very sort of international upbringing and sports upbringing as well and, and uh, good only good memories from my childhood, to be honest. I had very nice parents, very cool friends, and the rest of it. Did you um, did you be, did you want to become uh, the same Alex as, as today in your childhood? Were you dreaming of? You know, we have we all as as children we have dreams. You know, we have crazy dreams. We one we wants to become a, a 
a footballer, another one wants to become a politician, the other wants to become whatever. So did you have kind of uh, um, uh, kind of a dream and, and is the dream, let's say, is, is today's Alex the same as um, Alex in your uh, childhood uh, um, dream? No, probably very different. I mean, you know, uh, my dad was first, he was the, the, the head of the Finnish Ice Hockey Federation and, and later on uh, a talent scout for the National Hockey League. And when I was a kid, I wanted to become a professional ice hockey player. Uh, and um, so did my brother, actually, younger brother. And, and, you know, I remember my dad, he'd say, boys, you need to remember to study languages. That's important. And we sort of looked at him, you know, dad, what, what are you talking about? We speak Finnish, Swedish and English and we're going to play in the NHL. So we don't need any more languages. And of course, later we realized that he was a talent scout and he saw that those boys are not going to be professional ice hockey players. So, you know, if you would ask my friends uh, uh, then, who are still my friends now, that, you know, Alex will go into politics, they would have laughed. I would have probably been the last person to go into politics, you know. If not sports, then 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 probably business or something like that. But what happened to me later was that I... I uh, I had done an exchange student year in the U.S., actually in Florida. And then when I graduated and had done my military service back in Finland, I, I went to study in the U.S. And the idea was I went on a little <laughs> golf scholarship because I was quite serious about golf. When I realized I can't become a ice hockey professional, I thought, okay, I want to become a golf professional. But I very quickly noticed that I you know, wasn't good enough. But I got really excited in studying and and. More specifically, I was supposed to study economics, so I took an accounting class and a macro class, and I noticed that, whoops, this is not my thing. But at the same time, I took a class in international politics, and that was it. I didn't look back since. And um, it was all about international relations and specifically the European Union. And remember that we're talking 1989, 1990, 1991. So it was, it was a very interesting period in international relations. And, but, but to give you a short answer, uh, is the Alex uh, the same or, or did he have uh, you know, ambitious dreams about politics when he was a kid? The answer is absolutely not. You have to in careers always understand that you know, a lot of it is, is, is sort of luck, a lot of it is hard work, but you have to keep your mind open and things things can happen. And I, I, I think I got quite lucky on the way. So from sports, I went to academia, from academia to civil service, from civil service to politics, and, and uh, then to banking and now back to academia. So no big plans when I was a kid, apart from sports. You, um, you decided to go to the US. Uh, was there any specific reason why the US or did you, did you want just to go abroad or? What was the story? No, I mean, uh, you know, there's, uh, I guess, uh, I guess the basic idea was originally to, to, you know, really get efficient in language. I mean, I'd spent a couple of summers in Canada and the U.S. when I was a teenager and I quite enjoyed it. You know, 1970s, 1980s lifestyle in the U.S. and Canada was quite relaxed and advanced in many ways. Um, and then, uh, you know, when I decided to go to Florida, as an exchange student, the idea was that I could play golf all year long. And the same thing, of course, when I when I went to South Carolina to Furman University. So the the, the idea was to combine the, the possibility to do sports and study at the same time with a little scholarship. That was the basic idea. There wasn't this sort of you know big ideological dream or ideal that I want to go to the, you know land of um, opportunity and, and the rest of it. But of course, you know, when you live in America for five years, uh, it becomes part of your identity. And I'm a big fan of, of things American. There's no no denying. And of course, you know, my education, albeit later went to College of Europe in Bruges and to London School of Economics, it was still very Anglo and Sorbonne, but it was still very, you know, Anglo-Saxon in that sense. Um, but but it all started just because of the sport. So there wasn't this big ideal. I mean, I, I went there probably for the wrong reasons, but I came out with the right ones. Um, so I know so many energetic people and people who are just like, uh, keep doing th so interesting uh, stuff, but you are the only one who is, in my mind, the one, the man on the move. So you always <laughs> do some, some, you, you surprise me all the time. I have been following your, um, 
your news or following your, your life since 2008, you are the man on the move. You are the one being with the capital T. So, um, so what keeps you moving? You, you, you went to the U.S. and then from the U.S. You did, you, you did your, uh, you lived in Paris, you lived in Brussels and London, and, and now you are in Florence. So what keeps you, what keep you, keeps you moving? Well, it's hard to say. I mean, you know, some part of it is probably genetic. So, you know, you, you're sort of born with certain energy levels and, and et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and some of it, as I say, is, is haphazard and a little bit lucky as, as well. Um, and um, I guess, you know, some basic values that were installed to me when I was young, you, you know, really conscious about them, but, you know, to, to do your best to work hard kind of stuff. So, for instance, with my kids, I'm, I'm using a thing that my parents used to tell me. It was like, dream, believe, work hard and succeed. So dream, believe, work hard and succeed. And, you know, they're not sort of pretentious ways of, of doing or saying things. But I, I do think that there's one ingredient that drives me more than anything else. And, and, and that's curiosity. So the curiosity to try to understand. And with curiosity comes certain openness. And it's not an easy thing always to do, you know. I mean, it's it's because as you grow older, you might get a bit cynical and, you know, you might get a bit bitter. Why didn't things work out and the rest of it? But I've always been that, you know, a little bit overexcited kid on the block who wants to learn stuff. Uh, and that means that, you know, you, you, you put yourself into positions of, of discomfort. You know, it's not comfortable to be a politician. It's actually quite a shitty job, you know. <laughs> It's, it's really awful. <laughs> you get crap from morning to night and, you know, get public scrutiny in democracies and the rest of it. And people who've never met you have an opinion about you and it, it's not comfortable. So you put yourself in a sort of discomfort zone and and uh, then things happen. But yeah, to, to, to again summarize, I would say curiosity and openness and this constant fight against cynicism because I think that you know, if you become cynical, that's when you lose the lust for life and you start believing that you know better about someone else than they know about themselves. And I, I just want to wake up every morning and, and kind of be stupid and say, I don't understand, I don't know, and then learn. That's what has taken me to places which I must say are still quite comfortable. You know, I come from uh, Finland, I've been to the States, I've been to Belgium, I've been to France, I've been to the UK and now in Italy, it's not exactly like, you know, it's been hardship, if you know what I mean. Yes, yes, of course. And, and how about Florence uh, the decision? Has it uh, been easy to move to Florence and uh, what happened? I think you were living in, in Finland yeah. before Florence. And... No, actually Luxembourg, I forgot to Luxembourg. mention. Yeah, uh, so I was at the EIB. No, basically, I mean, what happened was to make a long story short, I, 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 I went into politics in 2004 and I always just wanted to do European politics. And, and then I ended up being in national politics with 24 hours notice because there was a scandal in Finland and, and they had to get a new foreign minister and I ended up there. Uh, but then when I, I left politics, when I had been finance minister, trade and, and prime minister, I lost the leadership challenge in 2016. And I decided at that moment that that's it. You know, I've done my job. I, I was very happy with what I had, you know, achieved. And, 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 you know, it wasn't easy, but, you know, got things done. And then I decided that I'm not going to do national politics anymore. And, and then the opportunity came to go to the EIB in Luxembourg, which was a wonderful experience. But that was a limited country mandate. So I knew that I would have to leave by the end of, uh, 2019, early 2020, and uh, then uh, I, I I got headhunted. Basically, uh, got an email from a company saying that there's this position at the School of Transnational Governance at the EUI that would I be interested to look at. I, I mean, I I still remember the moment I was sitting in the back of a car on my way from Luxembourg to Brussels to fly back home to to Finland to the family. And um, and I looked at it for five minutes and I thought, wow, you know, this looks super interesting. Sent it to my wife and I said, you know, can I call you in, in five minutes? And I called, what do you think? And she said, well, this looks like you. <laughs> and, 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 and I didn't look back. Of course, the process and the procedure, you know, the EUI, 
wasn't very easy. You know, there are application letters and intent and strategies and so on and so forth. But um, I really enjoyed it. And, and then when I got the job, uh, I, I was, of course, very excited and, and still am. And, it, and the School of Transnational Governance, it's wonderful because it's a bit of a startup, you know. We're doing new kind of stuff, new kinds of stuff. And, and uh, it's exactly what I wanted to do. I'm bringing together, you know, the best of academia and the best of the world of practice. And I am, you know, I wake up every morning thinking, hell, here I am in probably the most beautiful city in the world doing a dream job, so I ain't complaining. But actually, the, yeah. the, the following question related to the uh, School of Transnational Governance, you tweeted uh, um, a few weeks ago that uh, <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, it's true. It's a, it's, it's a sentiment. I. I probably put that tweet out in the morning after my Bialetti Mocha when I usually feel quite good. And, and you know, it, it, it's the kind of a thing that when you've been in politics, which is quite a rough job at the end of the day, and a lot of the meetings, how would I put it uh, diplomatically, are not very nice. Uh, but when, when, when you then come here and, and you realize that, you know, you're doing things which feel meaningful. In other words, part of it is teaching the young or getting people to think about things. At the same time, you're building a new institution um, with extremely motivated people who come from all kinds of different backgrounds from all over the world. Um, you know, I, I do think it's... Uh, I feel very lucky in the sense that, you know, you, th there are two things in life that, that matter and are connected. One is meaning and the other one is happiness. And I, I think happiness comes from leading what you personally believe is a meaningful life. I mean, we all have our ups and downs. Yes. And politics was a very rough business in the sense that it wasn't always fun because the attacks were you know, few and far in between. But here at the School of Transnational Governance, you know, you are, in Aristotle's terms, uh, doing one of the most noble jobs, in other words, teaching the young. Uh, at the same time, you know, you are in a very international uh, community of people from all walks of life, so you learn something new every day. And of course, you know, the STG is nice in the sense that it's a startup. So when I started here a year ago, we were 30, 35 people. By the end of the year, we were 100. By the end of this year, we'll be 200. And by the end of next year, we'll be roughly 300. So, you know, it, it's a really exciting sort of uh, stage of institution building. And, and, and that's why I, I, I'm sincere when I say that I... I wake up in the morning uh, with a smile, which is really nice. How do you spend your time in, in Florence? You do um, you do teaching, and then you do sports, cycling. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, first of all, I, I, I obviously I commute to Finland because my our son and my wife are in Finland. Our son is in high school, so we didn't want to take him out. My wife is working. Uh, she didn't want to leave her job, which is fully understandable. She's had to suffer enough from my career as things stand. Uh, and our daughter is studying in London. So, you know, we do a lot of WhatsApping, of course, for dinner and, and things like that. Uh, but, um, you know, the bulk of my life right now is, is in many terms, you know, leading an organization, uh, institution building. So it's making sure that, you know, our funding is there, that our branding is working, that as we start growing, you know, over 150 people, that things are working. And, and obviously a lot of, you know, the thing about leadership is knowing how to delegate and who to delegate to as, as well. I don't teach that much. Uh, I mean, uh, I do have this uh, sort of, um, you know, conversational course with the master students, or I did until they went to do their internships. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, then I do a lot of, of course, you know, lecturing and talking around the world 
right now on Zoom to, to various parts. So it, it's very much about institution building rather than teaching for me personally. We have the chairs who do the bulk of the heavy lifting on that and also our part-time professors. Um, so now we move to the part that's uh, questions from friends. So I collected questions from different people, different countries and and then uh, um, people have been uh, really interested in, uh, in 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 posing these questions and and, and, and getting answers from you. So uh, the first question from from uh, Yasmin from Finland. So Yasmin uh, uh, wants to know how do you, uh, as a sportsman, how do you contribute to the um, young people uh, your uh, sport enthusiasm? Well, I don't know. I've, I've never been very good at hiding things. So I'm quite a transparent kind of a guy. And that means that, you know, I've always loved doing sports. So I don't sort of, you know, do sports in the dark, if you will. And and I remember when I was um, an MEP and then later a minister, there were even some people who criticized me heavily for for doing sports. A lot of cynical people who don't necessarily you know, like my lifestyle, uh, would be quite quick to criticize and condemn the fact that I would, you know, go for a run or do a triathlon or whatever. Uh, but the way in which I would answer Yasmin is to say that I kind of wanted to lead by example. And, and I hope I do that. So I'm not, you know, forcing anyone to do as much sports that I do. And But I, I, I do have a philosophy which I, I stick to, and that is that one hour of exercise gives you two more hours of energy uh, for each day. Uh, the reverse might be true when you overtrain. So, you know, two hours of training might take one hour of energy away. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I do my thing and I don't really, I don't, to be very frank, I don't really care what other people think about my sports. It's at the end of the day, it's a very private thing and an individual thing to do. And I just find that I, I, at least, I hope that I'm a better person or nicer person when I when I do sports. I know I get a bit edgy when when I don't do them. So, uh, yes. so I'm not forcing anyone to do it. But you know, one hour of exercise gives you two more hours of energy. That's quite a good thing to remember. Yes, Berti from Finland uh, wants to know what exceptional achievements that makes you famous? Well, fame is not an end in and of itself. And to be honest, after you leave politics, the thing you want to do is basically, you know, go under the covers and and uh, and, and you want to be a private person. I must admit that I, I will, it will be very difficult for me ever to work in Finland because of the fame issue. So I, I quite enjoyed moving to Luxembourg where I was almost incognito. I quite like to hang out here in Oltrarno, you know, Piazza Tasso and other places, San Frediano, because no one really, you know, knows me, which is, it's lovely. It, it, it gives a certain freedom. I don't, you know, have to be something all the time. Um, what are the biggest achievements? I, I would say there, there are two that I, I, you know, apart from the fact that a lot of people come up to me and, you know, say, okay, you know, I saw that, for instance, you know, you were doing sports and, and therefore I started and you changed my life and or, you know, whatever. That, that's, that's, that's really nice feedback. Uh, but, but two things for my political life. One is when I was prime minister, we pushed through a bill which allowed for gay marriage. Uh, and it was something that I initiated also uh, as a minister, which is quite unusual because when you're an executive role in government, uh, you know, you, you don't go and sign uh, a, a petition first. But I, I did that because I always felt very strongly about, among other things, gay, gay rights um, uh, and the GLBT community. So I was very happy that that happened, uh, you know, basically during my watch. And, you know, some would argue that I, <laughs> part of the reason that I then got, you know, ousted from politics is, is, is that, you know, I was too outspoken on, on these issues, these liberal issues. Uh, the second thing I'm quite proud of is is, is um, negotiating peace in the war in Georgia. Uh, I was chairman of the OSCE at the time in 2008, and I know that Sarkozy took all the credit, but you know, with all due respect, uh, the peace agreement was written on on the laptop of my advisor, uh, Jan Netalas, who is now actually the managing director of the Marti Ahtisari Peace Foundation, CMI. 
But in any case, so those two things, uh, you know, gay marriage and, and peace in Georgia were two things that I'm particularly fond of and happy. Of course, there are many other things that happen during the day, during the years, but but uh, those would those I would sort of raise as one notch above the other. Yeah, this is this is really interesting because uh, uh, Shiva from Iran uh, wants to know because you are in favor of sanctions against uh, the Iranian regime, but uh, she's she's very concerned. I think that's misquoting. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, you know, it, it's not. It, it's to be honest. I mean, I I've been a strong advocate of the JCPOA. Uh, agreement with Iran, and I haven't been spe speaking out publicly or otherwise for Iranian sanctions. So I'm, you know, I, I'm the chairman of the board of Marti Ahtar's Peace Foundation, and I try to look for solutions, not sanctions. Because her concerns are, that she lost, uh, she lost uh, relatives and she lost friends as a result of this, uh, the current uh, 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 Corona, Corona uh, crisis, and uh, she's just like saying that it's one of the reasons the lack of of medical equipment in Iran and, and of course sanctions, the European sanctions has been one of the reasons she thinks that. So do you have a reflection on this? Yeah, I mean, sure. Um, I mean, you know, sanctions are the instrument that the Euro the strongest instrument that the European Union has in, in foreign policy. And of course, you know, if you had a choice between sanctions and, and uh, and, and uh, aggression, sanctions are always a better way to go. Now, the Iranian case is quite specific because there's been uh, an agreement which we, in professional language, call the JCPOA agreement between the European Union, Iran, uh, and the United States. And it was very much brokered by first Kathy Ashton, uh, who was the high representative and later Federica Mo Mogherini and, and facilitated by the director general at the time of the European External Action Service, Helga Schmidt. Uh, and I, I, I thought that was a very sensible agreement to have. The problem started to re-emerge actually when I was at the EIB and the United States uh, unilaterally withdrew from the JCPOA. Uh, and and it became very difficult for uh, the European Union to act by itself. Uh, now, if the question is prefaced that you know medical equipment, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, then you know it's very difficult for me to to answer and say, yeah, well, it's good that medical equipment. But I put it this way: I hope a solution will be found. I mean, you know, the same thing goes with the sanctions with Russia. You know, they are there for a reason. And the reason is that. Russia has illegally annexed the Crimean Peninsula uh, and, and is, is, is uh, engaged in, in questionable activity in eastern Ukraine. So, you know, you, 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 can't, you can't break agreements without uh, there being some kind of, of consequence. Yes. Uh, and uh, I hope that we find a solution with Iran. Yes. So, Heike um, Arika sends uh, greetings to you and uh, he is interested in the following question uh, how do you feel after politics uh, you, um, you have been in power but you are not anymore uh, so how does this uh, the transition from from a person with the political power to a person with the no political power you have academic power i think but not anymore political power so how does it feel and yeah, I mean, first of all, hello to Heik. He is a wonderful friend and colleague over the years, um, and a strong supporter as well. Much of it, which which I appreciate. I mean, to be very frank with you, I I feel very happy. I feel very free, and I feel very relieved. You know, it. I I feel that you know there there, there are two types of people in politics. There are those who can't live without it, and there are those who go in it for a reason, and then. Uh, have a fairly easy way out to a certain extent, and I, I hope I'm I'm part of the latter. Um, I came into politics quite late. I think I was 36 when I became a member of the European Parliament, and actually the same year I became member of of a centre right, uh, what I would call liberal party, uh, in in Finland, um, and 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 then. You know, in 12 years, I uh, four years as MEP, and then 
eight years in government, 3,002 days, who is counting? But as foreign minister, as minister of trade and Europe, as prime minister and finance minister, and you know, you, you can't ask for anything more. It was a phenomenal ride. Um, uh, and again, you know, I come back to the notion that some of it was due to, to luck, being in the right time at the right place, and, and some of it was due to hard work, but I, I don't miss it. There's not one day goes by that I would, you know, long back and or, or think that, oh my God, I was so unfairly treated that why did I lose the leadership challenge? You know, I did what I did. I did the best that I could. Um, I think the track record historically was good in the sense that we were able to turn the Finnish economy around in a difficult situation. I hope I made Finland more liberal, more international, more tolerant. I hope I touched the lives of a lot of people in a positive kind of a way. But then once you're out, you're out and, and you have to sort of, you know, you have to live with that reality. And that reality for me and especially for my family has been a great one. You know, it's uh, I joke around and I say at the end, in the beginning, I must admit that I was very lucky. You know, I had a lot of support, very popular in Finland. Um, the most popular politician in Finland for many years because I did foreign policy and European affairs. And I was, but when I was prime minister and finance minister, you know, I, I didn't enjoy it. You know, it's, it, you know, you don't like to cut people's, you know, welfare and other things. But you know, sometimes you are in a situation where you have to make tough choices and you do them. So when I was walking down the streets, there was more of the middle finger. Nowadays, when I walk down the streets in Finland, there's more of the thumbs up. And, <laughs> and that's quite nice. And I, I, you know, I really don't long back to it uh, at all. So to Heikki, hello, Heikki, you know, nice to hear from you. And um, I'm as happy as they get. And power uh, might be, in, 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 in Kissinger's word, a wonderful aphrodisiac, but for me, it was none of the above, uh, you know, it was a way of, of fulfilling things and doing things. And I'm really happy with what I'm doing at the moment. So the following question is from, from uh, Heki's wife, Laura Arekka. So Laura wants to know, um, how do you see the role of the EU in supporting democracies in, the, in Europe in the near future? Uh, and what is the role of universities in, in supporting this democracy in the European countries and and then they, they, they um, has there been any change in these uh, roles comparing to the past and um, or should be there uh, any role for uh, universities or for the EU to support democracies in, in, in different EU countries and I think I think uh, if I understand her intention correctly she is concerned with the um, uh, uh, backsliding of democracy in, in, in some uh, some European countries that I don't, I don't want to mention. Sure, sure. Well, I mean, you know, to give the first answer, I, I think we quite often forget the big picture why the European Union exists. And, you know, it, it's, you can simplify it into, you know, peace, prosperity and security, right? I mean, that, that's why the EU was founded in, in the early 1950s. Uh, the basically centrifugal centrifugal force of it has always been about democracy and and, and freedom and, and and basic values you know as outlined in our human rights declarations and the conventions and and the rest of it and and we should never underestimate the fact that the way in which the european union promoted democracy and freedom and social market economy and globalization won the cold war you know, it was simply a better model than authoritarian regimes and communist and socialist models of, 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 of controlled economies. And, and if we keep that in mind, you know, what has the EU done to promote democracy? Well, you know, it's old news now, but Central and, 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 and Eastern Europe, they would not be democratic, was it not with the help, of course, of the United States, but also with the model that the European Union created. Now, am I sad to see that there are some anti-democratic tendencies in, in some EU member states at the moment? Of course I am. But that needs, seems to be a little bit, you know, the, the game in town and, and, and the mega trend. whether, you know, we saw it with Brexit, we saw it with, with Donald Trump, we've seen it 
you know, with with some what I call macho men leaders around, etc., uh, etc. Et so, you know, I I think it's it we should we should never forget that democracy is a fight that we have to pick up pick every day, if if we want to live in free societies. Um, and and um, you know, I would say to Lena that the 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 thing is that when democracy was created, it was supposed to be slow and cumbersome and compromise seeking and and representative but now with technology democracy has become much more fast paced so everyone has to have an opinion within seconds and and that has made things a little bit more complicated uh what should universities do about it well i i, I think it's in the basic nature of humanities and social sciences with science, science which we're dealing with of course uh, in, in, at the European University Institute is, 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 is to hold certain values, inalienable rights, uh, values of democracy uh, close to our heart. And, and of course, you know, academic, with academic freedom comes the opportunity to, to have an impact. And, and I know you jokingly said that there's little power in academia. Well, I, I think there actually is quite a lot in, nowadays. You know, you can have an impact with with ideas and with facts and with argumentation. Uh, so, final point on this: What do we do? You know, at the School of Transnational Governance, we of course have what's called EDMO, the European Digital uh, Media Observatory, which fights fake news and disinformation. And I think fake news and disinformation is basically the cancer of democracy. So when you have free speech and, and modern technology, you can then have an impact uh, on, on, on public discourse, which takes you into a completely different world. And it doesn't even have to be, you know, algorithm based, but you can end up in, in virtual realities. And when you end up in virtual realities, it's very difficult to have a democratic society. And I, I think that's what we can do in the academic world is is to fight for the facts, basically, and, 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 and promote ideas. That's what keeps democracy alive. Yes, thank you very much. So, Nile from the UK wants to know, what is the role of, or how important is exercise um, in academia and politics? <laughs> well, for me, in my particular lifestyle, it's always been a big part of it. And I, you know, I keep on saying, I get quite often, I get asked, um, you know, from parents or, or, or young students, what should I study? And I said, listen, you know, I can't give you, you know, advice on what to study or, or, or apart from the open mind and, and, and curiosity. But one thing, and I can't give you, you know, advice on what the future of the, 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 the job market will look like, say, in 2050. I mean, no one, has, no one of us will, will know. But, but I can give you advice in three things. Number one, don't memorize, don't learn how not to memorize, but to analyze. So be analytical in your thinking. Second, uh, uh, take care of your body and your mind. And here's where the training comes in. I think future careers are going to be all over the place, a lot of self-employment. And, and then you need to take care of both your body and your mind. And, and taking care of your body is three things. It's, it's, it's eating well, it's sleeping enough, which is essential. And then it's 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 training in one way or another. Uh, so for me, that was always a big part. Then the third thing I do give uh, advice on is uh, I think you know the one thing that machines or robots or artificial intelligence can't do is 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 emotional intelligence. So I, I do think that for any student of the future, you have to be emotionally intelligent and be able to you know have sympathy and empathy. Um, especially empathy to, to understand what other people are doing. So learn how to analyze, learn how to take care of yourself and, and learn how to be empathetic. And I think you get quite far. For me, training was very important. I had the choice of, you know, training one hour, or drinking one hour, one, one bottle of wine. And I choose the, the former rather than the latter. Okay, thank you. So uh, now we move to another section that's called the challenge. The challenge is answering a question in, in uh, less uh, than a minute. So you have one minute to answer. <laughs> I'm a fan, I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, one thing you regret in your life? 
I really don't have any regrets, to be honest. I, I don't look at things from a negative perspective. I get asked that question very often, but, you know, with regret usually comes, uh, 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 you know, this feeling that, that, that you know, you, you sacrifice something or so. So I, I really don't have any regrets. Perhaps I have said stuff when I was young in a wrong kind of a way to someone. Anytime I've hurt someone's feelings, I regret that. That, but I can't pinpoint one particular moment. What is your favorite political position? What's my what? Uh, which of the political positions you 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 hold uh, has been the, the your the favorite one? Foreign Minister of Finland was definitely the my favorite position. I, I really enjoyed it and I, I felt that I was quite good at it. Second favorite was most probably member of the European Parliament. Uh, it was one of my ideal jobs. And as I said, I, I didn't enjoy being Prime Minister or Finance Minister, but that was also the situation. So it's a good way to sacrifice yourself. Um, will we see you uh, at, at some point in the future uh, becoming President of Finland? <laughs> I doubt it. I doubt it. I, I think... Uh, You're going to have to talk to my wife before that. And in any case, you know, you must remember that, in, you know, politics to a certain extent is a, it's like a golden cage. I mean, you know, you, you, you put yourself out there for, for daily scrutiny. And, uh, you know, I, I think I've done my, my job in politics. I mean, of course, you never know what's going to happen in the future. I mean, you know, say hypothetically that there's some racist... Uh, potential Finnish president and 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 you know there's a movement that you know well you know we don't want to go that way then think but I, I have absolutely no plans in that direction to to be honest with you uh, but you never know what the future brings and I, I don't say this as a political answer this is this is my gut feeling I'm very much a fatalist you know if it happens it happens if it doesn't happen it doesn't happen I, I, I think I've done a lot for God and country already if you know what I mean yes Because uh, you ruled out becoming uh, the candidate for uh, the mayor of Helsinki at, uh, I think, oh, God, yes. a few months ago, and you I, said, okay, this is not, yeah. not the thing that I would like to do, so... Uh, no, okay. definitely not. No, I mean, you know, I've always said that international politics is easy, it's about war and peace. Then national politics becomes a bit tougher. And then local politics, that's by far the worst. <laughs> so, uh, no, no, I've, I've said I've, I've excluded myself from Finnish, the future of Finnish politics. I mean, international relations is different. European institutions, European commissioner is different. But I have no plans to go back to Finnish politics. None, zilch, nothing. So in one of the talks, you said uh, a former politician, now a banker, talking about happiness. And then you followed up this by saying, uh, how credible is that? Um, I mean, here I am, a former politician, now a banker, talking about happiness. I mean, how credible is that? What was going on in your mind? Yeah, no, I think that was, uh, it was probably a TED talk that I was giving. Yes. And, uh, you know, they had asked what I want to talk about. And I said, why don't I talk about happiness? Because, I, you know, I do a lot of reflection about you know, a meaningful life and a happy life. And I do a lot of reading about the subject. And uh, and I just wanted to start the talk with a slightly lighter note that, you know, here comes a former prime minister and a banker. And what would he think about happiness? Because obviously the picture that you have of a prime minister is power and a picture that you have of a banker is money. So, you know, why, why should a prime minister or a banker be philosophical about the meaning of life? And, and that was my sort of starting point to the discussion. Uh, your favorite American president? Uh, I like a lot of them. I think probably Abraham Lincoln uh, would, would be, be number one in terms of historical. Uh, then the one that always captivates my mind, number two, is, is John F. Kennedy. Um, and, and then I must say that, you know, the first um, colored president of the United States, Barack Obama, is, is in many ways someone I have always looked up to. But I like a lot of the American presidents. Many of them have been actually quite good. And how about the Finnish presidents? Yeah, I mean, uh, for me, the number one is, is, is uh, Marshall Mannerheim, who, you know, was first and foremost, of course, our war hero and hero of independence. 
but but secondly also president. And then after that, I'm a huge fan of Marti Ahtisaari, our Nobel Peace uh, Laureate. Um, and I also, you know, I, I've had my differences with our current president, but I, I quite like it. He's a... Uh, He's quite a good operator and has, has done a lot of good things for Finland. So those would be my my top three, if you will. You always look happy and optimistic and smiling. Do you have? A, I think I'm not the only one who wonders if you have a, a down moment. Do you, do you get depressed? Do you do you get the sad? <laughs> yeah, I mean, not no, not depressed, but I, I, you know, I've been close to depression or burned out once in my life, and I, I wrote about it in my sort of uh, midterm memoirs uh, in Finnish, albeit. Um, and and uh, it's chapter 14 of my book, and it, it's called The Dark Moment. And that's when I was, was prime minister and, and, you know, I had become prime minister, I'm not saying by accident, but um, not according to plans. And we were only a few months off the elections when I became PM. And uh, things were not looking very good, and I felt that the attacks were becoming a little bit too much. But those are the moments when you basically rely on your family and friends. And 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 there were, you know, three people especially that helped me out of the rut. Uh, you know, one was my wife, who who is is is, is the most important person in my life, together, of course, with my children. And the second one was my dad, and, and thirdly, I had a good friend who I talked to a lot. Um, so yeah, you know, you, you get your moments when things are not going well, and just like anyone, you know, there, there are moments when when you don't feel happy. So, but uh, I don't get depressed. No, I'm I'm quite a positive person. So, I'm lucky with that. So I just, uh, in fact, you just you you mentioned your your family, and I got a question from unknown person. I don't want to mention his her name. His name. Uh, but she asked me, she was really interested to see what kind of relationship do you have with your parents? And then I told her, maybe this is too personal and he might not be happy <laughs> answering the question. But you, since you just mentioned the family, so I thought maybe... Yeah, sure. I mean, I don't talk about my family publicly for security reasons, but obviously now that I'm out of politics, it's a little bit easier. But I think everyone who knows me and uh, I, I think either public or private knows that I've always been very close to my dad and I've always looked up to him. He's, he's 86 years old now, still working. Um, <laughs> and, I said, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, I joke around, he's, he's, uh, he's engaged to Miss Finland, <laughs> but Miss Finland from 1958. So uh, it's no, no worries, Pirko Mannola. But yeah, so very good relationship with my dad always. Uh, my mom died in 2008 and... Uh, you know, she she died. She had epilepsy and had uh, had quite a tough, you know, last 15, 20 years of her life in, in in terms of you know mental health issues and and others. So that was never very uh, easy in many ways. But yeah, I've been always very close to both of my parents, and uh, I've been very fortunate. I was very fortunate to have good parents who were very loving and caring. And I don't say this, you know just for the hell of it. It was, it was the kind of parents I could talk to about anything. You know, it, it didn't matter what I had done. I could always go to them and and explain and say sorry and, and not feel like, you know, I'd be hard done by. Yes. Uh, a book you uh, you recommend us to read? One book you recommend? Uh, yeah, I would, you know, I mean, there are obviously, you know, hundreds, but one of the latest books that I really liked is by Adam Grant, who is a psychologist. And he wrote a book called Think Again. And the basic premise of that is that for us to develop as human beings, it's very important to be open-minded and curious and to think about issues again. Because now we live in a society where everyone sort of pushes back and wants to prove that they're correct. If you turn that around and say that if I'm wrong, I've just learned something, I think that's a good starting point. So Adam Grant, Think Again would be my... Uh, book recommendation. And uh, who is your favorite Finnish writer? Uh, is it a tough question? Well, no, no, no I mean, not, not not really, because I mean, I, I, I read very, very broadly. So, I mean, I, 
I don't usually read that much of, of thrillers, but there's one thriller writer that I've read every book of, and his name is Ilka Remes. The, you know, Finns will, will know that. Uh, then there is a slightly out of the box author that I've read all his books as well. Uh, his name is, is, is Joel Hartela. He's actually a doctor, medical doctor, and an author at the same time. And then finally, I like Sophie Oksanen a lot, who is, uh, uh, who's, who's written a few really good and thought-provoking books as well. So I have, a, I have a, you know, just like with anything, a lot of favorite authors. Yes, yes. So um, the European Commission has recently adopted the first AI framework. So mm -hmm. there, is a, there is a regulation for uh, AI technologies, and uh, it's the first time ever that there is a... a such a, such initiative has been taken. So do you think it might be, it's a, it's a good, uh, it's a good uh, step to regulate AI yeah. intelligence? No, I, I definitely think it's a good step. And, and it's interesting that you raised the issue because uh, just yesterday, uh, we had one of our executive trainings with uh, American and European legislators, so MEPs and a lot of people from Washington. And, and the basic theme is about artificial intelligence and, and one of the speakers we had was Margaret Vestar uh, who's always you know obviously behind the initiative and, and, and there's a lot of good thinking about AI and human-based AI etc and I think it's important that we do regulate this field uh, not only because it's a bit of an unknown but I'd much rather have the good guys doing the algorithms than the bad guys and, and we do need to have some regulation on this so i think the european union has made a good stab uh to start on the issues of ai as uh, as well you know it, it's always going to be a private public partnership but it's good to have some regulation around it so the use of technology in social life evolves and and people and history tells us that people will always use, this, use these technologies uh, for the uh, ill and for the bad. Uh, do you think, what, what's your reflection on, on, on this fear towards, towards technology? Do we fear humans who are using these technologies or do you think we fear the technologies themselves? And why do we, why do we have, like as humans, why we always have misused the, uh, the, purpose, the, the good uh, purpose of, of these technologies? I think, you know, there's a wonderful book by a Swedish-American professor, I think he's at the MIT, and he's called Max Tegmark, and, and he wrote a book called Life 3.0. And what he does in that is to talk about three approaches that we human beings have towards artificial intelligence. One is the sort of the, the optimists, the one who say that, you know, let's let's not regulate, let's just do its thing, you know, it's going to turn out okay. The second one are the pessimists who think, you know, all hell is going to break loose when, uh, you know, we, we reach the notion of singularity and, and, and uh, algorithms and AI will take over. And then somewhere in between are the, you know, I don't know what he called them, tech realists or, or whatever it is. So, you know, I'm optimistic about it, but I, I do realize that there are some issues that we have to deal with throughout. And, and I actually think that technology throughout mankind has given us more good uh, than bad. At the same time, we have to admit to ourselves that no technology is neutral and technology can be used in negative ways. You know, we can talk about, uh, for instance, uh, cyber attacks, we can talk about drones, we can talk about, you know, cyber warfare or, or warfare used non-human warfare. There always, I think, needs to be a human intermediary, no matter what we do with artificial intelligence. And, and I, think, I think it's going to be important to, to keep that in mind. I, you know, to a certain extent, you could say that we're already cyborgs. I mean, the first thing you do when you wake up in the morning is to touch your phone. And, and, and the rest of the rest of your days is, is, is full of technology in one way or another. And, you know, one day we might have neural laces whereby, you know, the commands and the use of technology is, is basically instantaneous uh, and linked to our brain. Edison has not been able to cure me, so I rely on technology to help me communicate and live. 
That vital system that Professor Stephen Hawking relies on has recently got an upgrade. So, you know, there are a lot of ethical issues there as well uh, that, that have to be dealt with. And that's why I think human intervention is always good. So, so I, I look in my PhD, I look specifically on the human rights issues raised by artificial intelligence technologies, and I focus on humanoid robots. So do you think such a research is useful? And do you, do you recommend people to, um, to go into the similar, similar questions? Yeah, I think it's key in many ways. I mean, you know, we talk a lot about artificial intelligence bias. Uh, the way in which, you know, face recognition or voice recognition uh, tries to determine what kind of human being is behind uh, a certain event. Uh, and obviously those algorithms are, are quite simple. And, and, you know, a lot of algorithms, for instance, talk only about two genders, male or female, and they don't realize that they're transgender people. And, and this becomes a human rights, a fundamental rights issue as well. So it's an extremely, I think, interesting and fascinating field of, of study. I, I personally think that, you know, robotization and artificial intelligence in the big scheme of things, it changes three things. Number one, it changes the economy and the way in which we work. Number two, it changes politics and the way in which we communicate. And number three, it changes science and the way in which we are as human beings. If there is no research on how we change as human beings due to technological development, then I think we will be doomed uh, as homo sapiens. But if we're able to do the research and on the basis of that research, take the right ethical and moral decisions, I think that's great. I'll give you one final example on this. Say nowadays with gene sequencing and genetics. First genetically edited babies have been born it's already possible to char charge to start changing an embryo. So say in the future, you know, you know that the embryo, you would like to, it to have, you know, blue eyes or be muscular or be good at mathematics or be tall or be fat or be small or be, you know, lean, whatever. And you can start doing this. Then I think, you know, we're, we're very much at the spring of humanity and mankind and what it means to be a human being. Uh, and, and I would prefer not to change that too much. It's great to have technology as an instrument, but for us then to be changed from, you know, blood and flesh to something else, I'd start feeling a little bit uncomfortable with that. Yes. Thank Good you. luck with your research you. as well. Thank I think it's a fascinating subject. Yes, yeah. thank you very much.